Hi, you're watching another session of Vantage Point and I'm very, very excited because I have the opportunity to be on the sideline of the Razak Round Table looking at branding and the nation's branding or nations around the world and their branding efforts. And because of that, I get to sit down and have a chat with the best brains from Oxford University, especially from the Science Business School. And I have with me Catherine Bishop, the Associate Fellow of the UK Civil Service Commissioner, but works and also an affiliate of the Science Business School. And um, if I were to summarize what you have missed, if you're not at this round table, you've missed the most popular presenter so far, which is Catherine, because her points on the leadership has struck a few chords with, with the audience. But if I can sum it up, we've looked at the measurement on vantage point of the ranking of uh, national branding across uh, the, the international uh, environment. But uh, how do we link that to leadership, transformative leadership, and the perception people have of leaders? If I take into equation the countries that we are well uh, versed with, uh, down south, we've got Singapore. We all acknowledge that Singapore has been to the front of excellence, especially in industrialization and you know, uh, high impact technological areas and turn that into commercialized uh, units. But um, behind them, all these pursuits, we still see the figure of Lee Kuan Yew. And people in Malaysia still talk a lot, talk a lot about Tun Mahathir and where he's brought this country. So if I link that to Catherine's point about transformative leadership, if I look at the management done by uh, David Haig and his friends, they measure the values of companies on the stock exchange and from there they look at the intangibles also. Do you see a fusion of this perception against the nation or any national branding of any country? The Razak Roundtable um, started off this morning with conversations about brand identity, about definition, about shaping and influencing your brand. But one of the points that was made is that uh, a brand that is not authentic, that is not lived, um, uh, is not a brand at all. It, it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's where conversations about leadership come in, because trans transforming an organization or indeed a country is about transformational change often so that the reality and the brand are one, are fused. Um, and the conversations about uh, leadership, therefore, this morning were, were, were in that context, but they take on a particular resonance, I think, in relation to your question about Western views of leadership and uh, Asian views. Uh, 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 I started my presentation this morning talking about the fact that the Western press really regards the work of many transformational leaders in private and public sector as less than effective. So we do not collectively have a good reputation for transformational leadership. Yes. Um, that's the way the, what the media expects to find and indeed therefore that's what it does find. But for many leaders now there is a much clearer recognition that the complexity of the problems we face require a range of different leadership styles and a range of different leadership approaches, some of which I think perhaps fit better in a Malaysian context, as you yourself suggested, um, where we're starting to see a fusion of some of these ideas. Now, I can say more about uh, any of that, but that, that, that would be my response to your question. The, the interesting thing about the presentation at this roundtable also, you had a chance to sit beside Pomandu, an outfit who starts with very clear set objectives that you must make sure and ensure of this transformation, but you must work within the system that we have. If we have a supremely, supremely respected leader, then that issue doesn't matter because I have issues, but I trust this guy. And you know, that's it. I would not like sit down and write a thesis about how I feel, but I'm just gonna weigh it against that. And reality is chances are, he or she will do something about it. So are we still at that stage or we still need now to go deeper and break down what we meant by the branding of this nation into particular aspects and pockets of life? In a Western context, we are starting to think less about the hero leader, the individual most senior leader, 
and more about that person's ability to generate a leadership team. Um, your point about experiencing the reality of the brand is often something that the single most senior leader simply doesn't have sufficient control over. Um, it's a complex area, there are many, many touch points with citizens. So it would seem that the task of a leader in that context then is to energize and to generate leaders at all levels who can themselves lead their teams to deliver transformational change that is in line with an espoused brand or, or an espoused uh, uh, vision of the future. Malaysia, I know, has its um, vision of uh, uh, e economic transformation yes. in 2020, yes. uh, a, a vision which is obviously very clearly understood and yes. frequently referred to. Um, it's been most interesting to be in a room full of public service and private yes. uh, sector leaders uh, who clearly understand that and who are demonstrating some real energy to try to get some things done in their organizations, in their department, with their team. And I think that is the key to, um, to a real sustainable transformational change. I find it interesting during the Q&A or question and answer sessions where, you know, not only at this uh, uh, particular round table, but at other discourse that Raza School has done, people straight away comment on the aspect of authority and leadership because, for example, if you're asking for a more democratic and open leadership, then they'll say, yeah, but it will lead to chaos. I've been running this department this way for so long, and it's fine, you know? So how do we generate belief from the civil service themselves, for example? Because in this country, there's more than 1.1 million employed civil servants, for example, and, and this transformative leadership, no matter who the leader is, need to be translated at all levels right down to the very front line. Because you might hear in the media one thing spoken by the supreme leader, but the next day you have any dealing with any government department, that's going to be the mm. true test mm. of that particular mm. branding. So how do we, if we link that to programming, a specific leadership trail and traits, right up to being a bit more go with the flow and adapting it to the situation. How would you move that? I've heard how Pamandu described it. They start with no democracy at the beginning because they need to spell everything out so that it's clear, the vision is clear, people understand it. But as they go on, the final objective is we empower you mm. to take that how you like to take it. So that we'll discuss after this short break. You are still watching Vantage Point. I'm still here with the good people of Said Business School. In this instance, for this episode, it's uh, Catherine. So how do you measure the different touch points and then link it back? Because a leader can only do so much. Mm. But a leader can spell things out like what, what Pomandu has said. But at the same time, every other thing that I'm faced with and when I deal with any government agencies, I will directly link it back to the leader. So, programming this or being a bit more casual and free with it, I guess it's a given that it needs to be adaptive, but at the same time, when this, the ecosystem permits, then you go to a very regimented flow that brings security. I work a great deal in the UK and in Europe with um, leaders in organisations undergoing change, fairly complex change. There is none so complex as public sector change. Let's acknowledge that at the okay. outset. Um, in, for, for leaders in the public sector, one of the primary pressures on them from uh, ministers, from stakeholders, from the press and, and media is to demonstrate a tightly managed, firmly controlled, clearly predicted uh, change initiative that runs to budget. The difficulty for many of those leaders is that the changes they are trying to accomplish are too complex, are too uncertain, are too undefined, are too long term. Mm -hmm. 
uh, some of the changes we're focusing on in, in the Western Europe may, may take 30 to 50 years to, uh, 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 to complete. So the challenge for those leaders then is still to be able to um, uh, report to ministers and report to the media in ways that are acceptable uh, and that demonstrate some um, good governance and, and good management. But to recognize that the nature of, of the task, the nature of the endeavor that the leaders face requires something different, requires them to work in a much more um, empowering way, requires them to be coaches, not dictators, requires them to explain rather than to tell, um, requires them to create a context in which people can excel. Um, all of this is easy to say, but is very hard to do. What if it's benevolent dictatorship? You know, it's not, a, you know, it's not cruel in that sense. It's just the, the the answer has to depend on the context. Some of the things that we are trying to solve in this world of ours are so complex that they require uh, a large, diverse team that works well together. Right. Um, no one leader no matter how skilled or experienced, is likely to be able to solve some of these large, multifaceted, multifunctional problems. So the, the adaptive style is, is almost required, but everything in the system pushes one towards a much more technical or programmatic yes. style. So leaders really face that dilemma. And that's why you have questions, as we did this morning, yes. about the system making it hard for people to work in that way and I absolutely acknowledge and share that that experience so recognizing that none of this is easy uh, I think the answer is um, that it's a it's a slow and long-term process it's uh, about um, development of individuals development of teams okay. it's about the generation of new ways of collaborating okay. of recognizing that you are very talented, I'm reasonably talented, but together we are much, much more capable yeah. than we would be individually. Mm -hmm. um, it's about setting that kind of organizational context where you are allowed to make a mistake, yes. provided you have done, done it for the best of reasons, got, gone through the required governance Don't structures. All that. Clearly it takes time. Indeed, it's However, a slow process. the executive lived on borrowed time because they will have in a democratic system to go to the polls and that will be four or five years and some like we have acknowledged here will take 30 years mm. the 2020 vision started way back in 1990 also mm. that's a 30-year program mm. and Tun Mazi is no longer the prime minister you know we've had other ministers and other prime ministers now and and how would in a system where the top executive works in a five-year cycle of interest as a very in-your-face deadline that we have to work and nurture this time-consuming, painstaking, transformational change over the medium to long term. I can only give you par a partial answer to that because I recognize exactly the problem that, that you speak of. Um, I think part of the answer is that the political uh, environment, the organization um, that initiates, defines uh, uh, the endeavor, is also responsible for setting off a series of other organizations, often outside politics, right. NGOs, uh, private sector organizations, voluntary okay. organizations, who are also able to contribute to those longer term goals. And by themselves acting in an adaptive way, they can start off uh, a change initiative, which will continue to run even when there is regime change, because the political uh, sphere is only part of the whole system change that's underway. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've tried to do is paint clearly there what is a the theoretical picture. Yes. The reality is complicated and messy. Mm -hmm. But when we come across something that's complicated and messy, we shouldn't assume that's because we're not managing it tightly enough. Yes. Sometimes the solutions to these complex problems 
are by definition complex and messy themselves. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, in the U UK refers to them as wicked problems. Okay. They are different in nature from the problems uh, that we have faced in the past and therefore the approaches to solving them also need to be different. Okay, I've got to go to the commercial break but once we are back, there was this interesting question from the floor uh, but the comments made caught the applause when it was said by the panelists that, you know, you guys should have been paid more because that particular ministry I know have done very, very well. But at the end of the day, in a very democratic uh, country and information processes, you are reporting to the people whether or not you get bonus or increment or whatever it tells. It's a process. The people will judge you by how well the services to the people have been delivered. So if it's a Ministry of Health, at your public uh, hospital, how long do I have to wait in the queue? Mm. If it's not me, I might be bringing my elderly parents. Mm. And how well were they treated once they are there? So to bring all this to the minds of the frontliners is one thing. But we all know the civil uh, bureaucracy, public bureaucracy is very high as compared to the corporate one. Because the corporate one also works by financial years, KPIs, and whatever else. So structurally, how far have you seen changes done to accommodate these new realities? Maybe you can give us one or two case studies that you've come across or your own personal experience after this short break. You are still watching Vantage Point. I'm still here on the sideline of the Raza Roundtable talking about branding. And maybe if we look at branding from a corporate perspective for the longest time, let's look at it from a country's perspective. That's what we're doing. And when we talk about that, we're going to talk about leaders. We also have to talk about the civil service itself. So maybe I'm going to tap into Catherine's deep knowledge on this particular matter. Have you seen or have you come across the fact that what has been acknowledged as the bureaucracy, being able to change structurally and systematically to accommodate all these new, fast-growing demands of it, especially in the 21st century, because the generation Y, for example, will just take no, not going to happen. They don't know what no means because everything is at their fingertip. They go to sleep on their iPads, for example, as mm. pillows. So, how would a civil servant, for example, being so used to decades of regimented bureaucracy of the civil service, now transform him or herself if the system and structure doesn't make the environment conducive for that particular employee to change in the first place? I've seen two or three examples that uh, seem to me to be worth relaying. Um, but let's acknowledge at the outset, this is very difficult. This is whole system change. Yes. Um, and the examples that I, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to draw from Wales, which, uh, as I said this morning during my presentation, is the, 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 the country. The, the country that the was left out by EU it, in its Indeed, map, okay. indeed. The country, <laughs> Wales, um, nominally part of the United Kingdom, regards itself very much as a nation, um, uh, is represented in London at UK Parliament, but has its own parliament. Um, Let's take one example. Um, one of the things that the civil service initiated in Wales is a, a citizen stakeholder okay. survey, which was an extraordinarily rich source of data, direct from the mouths of citizens, of local organisations, of voluntary sector uh, organisations, of NGOs, um, it, it, giving responses to a series of questions about both what the government did and how they did it. Um, and because it came directly from the mouth of the citizen, um, that was an extraordinarily vivid way for civil servants to understand, if you like, the perception of their brand in the citizen's mind, but actually also, more practically, reactions to service levels, to the kinds of things that government was delivering. Um, and that started to open up the sense for civil servants of what the problem was. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a second example, um, the Government of Wales created individual local service boards which brought together police, hospitals, teachers, um, town planners, uh, environmental specialists and the civil servants from the Welsh Government in small groups focused on a locality trying collectively to develop uh, cross-functional solutions to very complex mm -hmm. problems. For those individual civil servants engaged with those people that was a very real and vivid um, demonstration of the need that they have to work together okay. with people outside the civil service with people whose responsibilities differ greatly from their own but who are also focused on solving local Welsh problems. That kind of real engagement can have a really transformational effect on those individuals and if they're senior enough they can then take uh, the lessons from that kind of uh, work locally back into their organisation and restructure their teams, invest in team development because that is I think the third thing which we must also um, uh, mention. Um, at the Side Business School at Oxford we have done uh, considerable amounts of work with uh, local government and central government deliberately designing development programs that try to expose them to a whole range of different leadership approaches to solutions, ways of solving a whole range of problems. Um, can I prove that, that, uh, that those kinds of endeavours make, make a difference? No, I can't prove it. Do I have some anecdotal and visible evidence that it does? Yes, I do. Maybe bringing the civil servants and the civil service physically closer to the grassroots is one way I quite looking agree. at. I quite agree. But especially so in Asia, where interpersonal communication... The, the strength of relationships yes. is very important, yes. So uh, have you guys at Oxford, at the Site Business School, been looking at, at this particular area of... of, of uh, we, we look at it at Oxford, but we've, I, we've also been looking at it as part of the practical work that I do mm -hmm. with members of the civil service. The key thing about bringing um, civil servants and grassroots uh, representatives together is to make sure that it's productive, that you're not simply bringing them together, putting them in the room and saying, go on then, get on okay. with it. Um, you need to have the right kind of process, you need to have some people who can facilitate the conversations, who can drive the groups towards a solution. Okay. And then dynamics. you... The group dynamics and the, the, the group dynamics, dynamics are very there. important. Uh, they are indeed, and and you have to have something that helps to overcome that. So, is that what Malaysia can be uh, beneficial to studies of this nature? Because on top of all that, we have the diversity of ethnicity, the diversity of um, religion, for example, and faith, and we also have the different demographic backgrounds of education and where you come from and you know it's rural, rural it's urban it's peninsular Malaysia it's from the Borneo side so would that kind of input into the studies that the, the science business school has will give more dimension especially so in understanding the world now that the engine of growth is shifting to Asia so if we don't understand all this so we're going to be trudging along but we're going to bring this baggage unsolved with us I think there's a real opportunity for Malaysia. As you say, the engine of growth is visibly shifting towards Asia. Um, I saw this morning in the room uh, a whole collection of people with very different backgrounds, uh, very different approaches. Um, and there is quite a lot of research that's beginning to show that diversity, if properly connected, is a factor that can make a big difference in solving problems and for private sector organisations in, in better results. Um, the challenge is respecting the diversity, recognising and valuing the differences between people, but actually also constructing ways that people can work together effectively. Today, in the room amongst the par participant group, I've seen a huge amount of energy, um, uh, which I think lays a very good foundation for using that diversity productively. I think it's the synergistic power of Science Business School and you know Razak School of Government, for example, which set a great platform for great participants to come. Thank you so much for making time to be on Vantage Point. Thanks to you for watching. We'll catch you in another episode of Vantage Point very, very soon. Thank you to Razak School of Government, and I'll see you again. Goodbye. Thank you. So much.